Well, good morning. Have you ever longed for something um, better? I think it's something that's really simple that we've all actually longed for. Times that we look around and whether it's we look at the world and the brokenness we see there, we think about uh, job situations, lack of purpose that we feel, whether it's uh, seeing a house that you wish you could afford or... um, Other times, there are people in here longing for children that you cannot have. Times of uh, looking at relationships and wishing that they were in better places. That longing for something more. That you wish that you could have, that you wish that you can enjoy. You see it as a good thing. You know it's a good thing. Sometimes even things that God makes clear to us is a good thing. And we long for something more. I think that Jesus, as he's leaving his disciples, actually leaves them recognizing that because of who he is, and he's proven himself to them to be, and because of the struggles that they're about to go through, they're going to feel that longing a lot. That longing for uh, the world to come, that longing for the full fulfillment of the promises that Jesus has made. That longing for a a place where people actually care for and support and encourage and build up and help spur on one another. That place where uh, the sick and the weary and the weak are tended to and cared for. And those with strength don't use it as a, a place to insist on their own rights, but instead serve one another. That place where the world would look like Jesus the place where the world was intended to be before sin entered and brought death and destruction. I think that longing for a new place, that longing for something more, is something that every one of us feels at different points. And it can actually be something that when we do feel it, uh, it's like the saying goes, it's the hope that kills You know, because how many times have you hoped for something more? You gave it your best shot, and it still wound up not being that. And it's the hope and the sorrow and the pain of seeing that it's not actually coming to fruition. That sometimes it's even, uh, we convince ourselves, it might would have even been better to not have had the hope to begin with. And I think that Jesus' disciples are going to walk through that. I mean, we know they are. We know that Jesus knows that they are. You see, he's told them about this incredibly difficult and hard set of circumstances that they're going to have to go through. He also told them about the rewards that are promised to them. And some of the best promises that are given in Scripture are things that Jesus has just spoke over his disciples. And yet, as he's leaving them, how do you think that they're handling it? You know, uh, there's a quote. The best things in life are often the ones hardest to get. Yet they are also the ones that are easiest to find, usually right in front of your face. I think that's true even if you think about Jesus and his disciples. The best thing in life for them is standing right in front of them, Jesus. And yet, how often do they seem to miss the points that he makes and not apply what he's teaching them to their lives? His disciples the ones he spent three years with. Uh, Just to put that into context, like, there are times that I struggle with frustration, with things that I have to deal with in the church, just because I'm human. And Jesus has spent double the amount of time in intensive discipleship with these 12 men And they still miss it. They don't get it. And yet he continues, I mean, even the beginning of this farewell discourse, it says about him that he loved them and he loved them well until the end. How patient he was in just coming back to them over and over. And as Jesus sets this up for them, and he's leaving them, 
what he's going to try to convince them of is that it's not the hope that's going to kill you. It's actually losing the hope. It's losing the focus on what Jesus has accomplished for them. You see, if Jesus, and as he's leaving, and some of what he's speaking to them is, look for the evidences that the the message I brought to you is a true message that proves genuine, that actually is going to accomplish what I said it's going to, and then build your life upon that. And he knows that what is going to actually slow them and stop them from being who he's calling them to be is if if they lose that hope. If they start to forget that Jesus really accomplished what he did. What I want us to see today as we look at this passage is that Jesus' victory for us gains us hope and sorrow Unity with the Father and courage in this world. Because, see, the believers that he was about to step in, the world that they're about to step into, uh, the one that we get to read about in the New Testament and in history books, is a world that in many ways is different than what the world we are in is like, but in many ways is similar. The reality is that even though there are all hosts of sin that we are just constantly 24-7 aware of because of social media and the internet, the reality is that people have been just as messed up as they've been for a really long time. Circumstances have always been difficult. It's always been a challenge to follow Jesus. Uh, This isn't something new. And that's confidence for us and that because it's not something new the answer is not a new answer the same problem has the same solution see the first thing that we have from jesus's victory for us is hope in sorrow and you may think how did these two things go together because a lot of times we like to think okay if i'm happy i just want to be happy and i don't want to be sorrowful I'll give you an example that most of us have experienced of where this, these two worlds collide. It's when you go to a funeral. How many times have you been in a funeral where there is deep sorrow over the loss of a person's life, yet you look around and you will see people with tears going down their face, still laughing, telling stories, remembering, finding joy in who the person they lost was. And as we follow Jesus as his disciples are, what Jesus speaks to them and makes clear to them is that they're going to have this constant mixture. You see, what we read in John is this. Jesus knew, and I skipped the first four verses because I feel like it's summed up in this question that Jesus asked just for the sake of brevity. Jesus knew they wanted to ask him, and so they said to him, Are you asking one another what I said? In a little while you will not see me again. In a little while you will see me. Truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has been born into the world. So you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy away from you. Now, Jesus likes to use the metaphor of birth, new birth, childbirth. John 3.16 is all about the new birth, being born again. It's where that language comes from when we say, uh, I'm a born again Christian. It became a popular question. Um, I'm not a mother. I've not had a baby. I know that what Jesus is talking about is not as soon as the mother has the baby, though, that all of a sudden she actually forgets all of the pain that she's gone through for that process. Uh, All the moms are laughing and the dads are looking at their wife to know what they should do right now. (laughs) But this is 
It's something where in that moment, what Jesus is saying is not, she actually forgets it all, and it's gone out of her mind, and she'll never remember it. But he's saying, compared to the joy, compared to the joy that she now has holding in her arms, her body may still be in pain. The recovery process is going to be long. But the tears that may have been from pain to start with are now tears of joy in comparison to what she is actually holding. Like, this is how Jesus compares the disciples and what they're about to go through is he talks about you will not see me and he's referring to his death. The world's going to rejoice. They're going to be happy. They're going to celebrate because I will be slain. But then you will see me again. And Jesus is talking about his resurrection, where he would come back to them and he would spend time with his disciples teaching and talking and admonishing and correcting and encouraging and preparing them for what's going to come afterwards. So he makes clear to them, I mean, just think about this. What is about to happen is not something that Jesus has told them or failed to tell them is going to happen. He's prepared them. They know that he views himself as someone who is going to be martyred for his faith. They know that he is someone who has said that he is going to be killed. They know that. And what Jesus is saying is that's going to become a reality. But they also know the resurrection is coming. Like, if they believe his words. Because he's also promised he's going to return to them and not abandon them that he's going to go back to the Father, that he's going to come again, that he's going to set forth this kingdom mission of restoring all things. Like, Think about that. If that's true, some might would ask, why would they weep and why would they mourn? Like, I think there's a couple of things that Jesus makes clear through this passage. One is that he, he expects them to weep and to mourn. And I think it's because, one, he understands humans. We don't, just because we believe something, all of a sudden uh, have no doubts, no questioning, and think our knowledge is just absolute. I mean, every one of us have been mistaken on things before. And it doesn't matter how long you've been on this earth. You still have times that you're mistaken on things. And so Jesus knows that, one, there's just a human component of They are going to have to walk through the season of him being in the grave where even if they believe and they hope for the resurrection, they are going to struggle with believing and hoping for the resurrection. That even though they may have the hope that he will rise again, they also will weep and mourn that their friend who has been with them for three years, teaching them, loving them well, caring for them, is going to be in a grave. So they're appropriately going to weep and mourn. You know, even if they believed it perfectly, that he would rise again, I still think they would weep and mourn. I think so because in the scriptures, what we see over and over again is that it's actually appropriate for us to mourn the sorrow and the destruction and the consequences of sin in this world while also walking in obedience. Let me give you an example. In Psalm 126 is what's called a song of the ascent. It was a psalm that would be sang as the Israelites walked up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's on a hill, so when they would go to Jerusalem for festivals, there's a, pa- there's a section of psalms that they would sing as they ascended up to Jerusalem. And Psalms 26 is one of those. It seems to be reflecting on the time that the Israelites were actually in Babylon, but now being restored. Uh, and so, this is what it says. It's written by an unknown author. But when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter then, and our tongues with shouts of joy. And then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we were joyful. 
Restore our fortunes, Lord, like water courses in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. The one who goes along weeping, carrying the bag of seed, he will surely come back with shouts of joy, carrying his sheaves. And if we can go back one verse, I want to point this out. Notice what it says here. The one who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. You know, sowing is not a passive thing. This is not a person that is sitting back, allowing the sorrow of the world to just cause them to be inactive and incapable and crumble. You know what kind of faith is the kind of faith that really shows itself? that shows itself to be genuine and true? It's the faith that endures when things aren't going according to plan. So, it's not the one who sits back and is sorrowful and just weeps over it. It's the one who sows with tears. While they are walking out, still being faithful to their task, seeking to be obedient and continue to do what God has called them to do, they at the same time have tears mourning the state of what is happening around them. It's why it also said the one who goes out carrying the grain, the bag of seed, while weeping, will come back with shouts of joy, carrying his sheaves. This reminds me of what we read in Galatians 9. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. You see, Jesus' victory gains us hope in sorrow. He gives us this hope that allows us to endure even while we mourn the state of things around us. Jesus himself looked out over Jerusalem and wept over them because he says, how I long to gather you to myself, yet you wouldn't. Yet he continued in faithfulness. You know, Jesus demonstrates for us what it looks like to care for the brokenness of the world, to actually be genuinely humbled and hurt and grieve the state of this creation. And I think it is only because that's the heart of our God towards this creation. He doesn't look around with a cold and callous heart that is hardened towards us and say, well, I want my glory, so I just guess I have to deal with them. He looks around at his world and those made in his image and he mourns over it. We read that it's the will of God that none should perish, that all should come to him. We see it demonstrated in Jesus over and over as he has compassion on those who have rejected him and spurned him. You see, if I came in here and in order to just kind of have a, a, a happy message, told you, following Jesus is just going to make everything better. You're going to be healthy. You'll never have health concerns. You'll never have to worry about cancer. You'll never have to worry about things that are going wrong in your family. And if you do, you just haven't prayed hard enough. If I came in here and said, God wants you to be rich and prosperous, so you just need to have a little faith, give money to the church, and trust that God's going to return it many, many, many times over to you, and you'll be wealthy beyond your wildest dreams. Because God wants you to be blessed and prosperous. If I came in here and I said, God wants you to be comfortable. He doesn't want you to ever have your toes stepped on. He wants you to just come in here and be encouraged to move and just continue your life day in and day out. It wouldn't be, one, believable for a long term. Because how many of you going out and living in your world would think that that would actually prove true over an extended period of time? 
It would be me putting your hope in the, the rewards that you would gain from your obedience and not what can you actually have that no matter how high the mountain is that you are on or how low the valley is that you're called to walk through, you can still have hope. Because see, his disciples were about to walk through that. They're going from the height of the mountain of literally walking with Jesus to wrapping up his body and putting it in a grave. And yet Jesus and his message did not abandon them. It was not a message that was even going to be compromised by that drastic of a shift in what they were going through in their life. They were going to have hope in the midst of sorrow. They were going to have joy while weeping. They were going to look around at the world and see its brokenness while longing for their Savior to rise again. And when they stepped out into the world after he rose again and he sent them, they were still going to be doing those things. Because it was out of a heart of compassion that grieves the results of sin in this world that they were going to be motivated, just like their Savior was, to go out and seek those who were lost, who were messy, who were hurting, who were enchained and enslaved by sin, and be liberators themselves, all the while still not seeing Jesus, but looking for that day when he returned again. They were going to have hope no matter the sorrow. They were going to mourn and weep, yet they would come back from their sowing with much fruit. And this is what you and I are called to. You see, the fruit that we're promised, it may be fruit that takes a while to come to fruition. It may be something that doesn't arrive soon but it's something we're called to endure for. We're called to look around and see the fruit that we are gathering in and to rejoice over that. And then we're called to look out at our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers and see there is so much more to do. There are more people who see the sorrow and the brokenness of this world and have no genuine hope in a Savior who will come again for them. But we have that hope to share. So, as he leaves them, and comes back again. It would only be for a time, and he would leave them, and his return, when that second return comes, when he comes and makes all things new. I don't know when it is. But we're in the same exact situation. We have troubles, sorrows, but we have a hope that will endure with us as well. The second thing is he brought us unity with the Father. You see, in John 16, starting in verse 23, it says, In that day you will not ask me anything. Truly I tell you, anything you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Now that was interesting to me because notice what Jesus says. You will not ask me anything, but you will ask the Father the whole reason Jesus came was because we had been separated from the Father. The whole reason Jesus had to become a son of God in the flesh was to earn the restoration of God and his people back together. To cleanse us, to purify us, to make us a, a, a people who love him and seek him. That Jesus would come and earn his place with the Father, and then give that to us when we had failed to earn it. And now, don't let it be lost on you what he's saying. You're not going to ask me for anything, but you're going to ask the Father. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. I have spoken these things to you in figures of speech. A time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. On that day you will ask in my name, and I am not telling you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, Jesus says, don't think about it like you got to come to me to be able to come to the Father. You know, they had the priest system, that you would go to a priest who would intercede for you and go to God on your behalf, that you had no right to approach 
the Father directly. And Jesus is saying, don't think about it like that. No, understand the weight and the just glory of what I have done for you. For the Father himself loves you. You. Because you have loved me and have believed I came from God. This promise is given. It's not just for, okay, I really love Jesus and I can't stand these people. Like, it is, I love Jesus. I love these people. Like you have been restored with God in such a way that the love that the Father has for the Son is now a love that rests on you if you believe in Jesus. Like just take your concept of what Jesus and his and the Father's love look like. This perfect love where the Father loved him and he loved the Father. Think about how that is never, that's something you have never experienced in any relationship on this earth. Even your closest relationships fail and fall inadequately short of that standard. And yet Jesus now says, if you love me and you believe in me, and he's not a fool, he knows that means imperfectly. He knows that means that His disciples, as he's going to say in a few verses, are going to abandon him and run away from him. He knows that. And yet, what does he say? Because you have loved me imperfectly, you yourself are now the object of God, the Father's perfect, never compromising or abandoning love coming to rest on you. Like This is a love that if you believe in Jesus, is yours to claim for yourself. Now, that is an if. Those who despise the Son will not receive the love of the Father in this way. This is for those who truly say, I want to live and follow Jesus. But Jesus didn't die so that you could just earn this for you to kind of tease it as something that's maybe yours and then take it back. Like this isn't something that he holds out. There's no carrot on a stick of, you know, keep following me and you'll get a little closer to this thing. It is Jesus died, rose again, and then took the love of the Father and for those who love him, gave it. That what he has given to you cannot be revoked. You see, God's love for you was not earned by you for being good or kind of outweighing your bad. God's love for you was earned by the love towards his son and the love of the son to the father. You see, God's not like you and me. You think about what it would be like for you or for me to give perfect love to someone who never reciprocated it. I would grow weary and eventually just stop. I am a finite human being. I have a limited capability. And there comes a certain point where it's just, I don't have enough to keep giving. The thing is, God didn't create us or make us because he needed somebody to love him. Because he needed us to satisfy his desire for being loved and revered and worshipped. He had that already, Father, Son, and Spirit, perfectly. So when he comes to you and me and is giving his love to us, he's not giving it to us and saying, I hope you don't mess this up. He comes to us and says, I'm giving you this because my son. But it is yours. It's what Paul says, who can take it away from us? No one can. So we have this just right and honor. It's why when you read Hebrews, for example, the author of Hebrews says this. After talking about how Jesus is the great and the perfect high priest who interceded between God and humanity, that he accomplished what we needed, that he became one of us, 
that he can sympathize with us in our weaknesses and our sorrows. Here's what he then says. Therefore, let us, not Jesus, us approach the throne of grace with boldness. We come into his presence if we love Jesus as fellow brothers and sisters of Christ coming to their father where every one of us now has the right to boldly come before his throne of grace so that we may receive mercy, which again, you don't give mercy to people who are perfect. It's recognizing that we are broken and yet we also have the unseparable right to come boldly before the throne of grace to help us in a time of need. You see, Jesus, as he's leaving his disciples, wants them to know, you know, for a while I've been with you, and you've been coming to me, and you come to me because you know I talk to the Father, but what I'm about to accomplish for you is going to earn you a place where you get to come before the Father in the same way I have. You will need no mediator No person to stand between you. And in fact, all shame and guilt and sin will be removed so that you can come before him boldly. Like, have you ever watched TV shows where there's like a king and is on his throne, and, you know, the people from the village come in to make requests, and you see them and they come in and they're just trembling and they don't want to look the king in the eye? You know, they think, the, the humbler I make myself in front of him, the more likely he is to not be offended at my presence and to grant me help. And what Hebrews says is we don't come like that to God anymore. We come knowing that there is nothing we have done and nothing we can do that can separate us from his love. But he welcomes us in. As children... He he receives us as he would receive Jesus because of what Jesus has done for us. Like we get to go with boldness, not timidity, not shame, not fear. Boldness because of Jesus. The final thing I want us to see is that because of these two things, because we can have hope and sorrow, and because we have unity with the Father, we can have courage in this world. Here's the reality. This world is going to be hard. Here's an even greater reality. We have everything we need to go through it well with the Father. You know, on this final point, I'm honestly going to do very little of my own words. I just want to read to you scripture about what we're called to in this world that demonstrates God's love for his people. Some of these are going to be passages from the Old Testament that show us his love for the Israelites, but which we can also infer is the type of love that he gives us now. Starting in a with what Jesus finished with. He said, I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, look, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative language. I don't know about you guys, but I read that and I'm like, it still feels figurative to me. (laughs) Maybe it's one of those circumstances where it's like, you know, you're in a room and you don't want to show somebody that you don't know what they're talking about. So you're like, yeah, yeah. You said words, and I I got those words. I like those words, and they make sense. Now we know that you know everything and don't need anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. So they're like, yeah, we got it, Jesus. And Jesus responds and says, do you now believe? Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home, and you will leave me alone, yet I am not alone. You know, the example Jesus is about to set for us is the very same hope that we now have. 
what gave him the confidence to say all of my disciples could abandon me? The world could hang me on a cross, and yet I can say, not my will, but your will be done. Yet it would be written about me that it was for the joy set before me that I would endure the cross. What gives that hope and confidence? It's the very thing we just talked about is now given unretractably to those in Jesus. Because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. That is no more war and animosity between you and the Father. You are now at peace with one another. You will have suffering in this world, but not with the Father. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. You see, Jesus is about to go to the grave and then rise from it. And he's leaving and preparing his disciples because they're about to experience what it's like to walk through this life with God your Father side by side with you. And they are going to have the presence of their Father in the Holy Spirit. Empowering and equipping and enabling and teaching and encouraging and rebuking and building up, doing everything that they need. They are about to go through so much that they can't imagine. And what hope do they have? But that when Jesus left them, and this is true for you and me, he left us with the same hope that enabled him to be obedient. He didn't give us anything that was just totally reserved from him. He gave us what he had to be filled with the Spirit, to have the presence of the Father with us, to be at peace with the Father. Like you look at Jesus and the life that he lived, and here's the reality. You have everything you need to walk in obedience like he did. We can never go back and erase our record and make ourselves clean. And there's so many ways that we have sin just twisted into our hearts that are being, it's being pulled out. But it is not because God has failed to give us what we need in order to move forward, to be courageous. Like we have what we need. He has given us more than enough. The, the limitations on how close you are to God is not that God has not come near to you. He has given you everything. And so I just want to read us passages that God shows just how much His commitment is to us. So that when we leave here today, what we go out of here thinking is, Everything that comes my way this week, my Father is with me. The Spirit is near to me. I have what I need to walk in faithfulness. And the lies that I am inadequate, well, they may be true, but guess who's not inadequate? Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit, and they are with me. Joshua 1. So they're about to go into the promised land. Joshua says this, be strong and courageous. You know what courage is? Yeah, courage is not not being scared. Courage is not this bravado, nothing bothers me, I'm okay, I take everything on the chest and keep on moving. A lot of times that's just stupidity. <laughs> courage is even when you face challenges and you are fearful, you keep moving forward. Be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their ancestors and give them as an inheritance. Above all, be strong and very courageous to observe carefully the whole instructions of my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the left or to the right so that you will have success wherever you go. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate. It's like, imagine a cow that's chewing cud and it goes down into like one of their 
four stomachs, and it comes back up, and they chew cud, and it goes down into another one, and it comes back up. Like, this is a disgusting image. But, like, that's how we're supposed to process God's Word. When you're doing devotions, if you're just skimming the page, and you're saying, my eyes have glanced across the light reflecting off of this page, and I remember nothing, that's not this. Uh, It would be better for us to spend the whole week reflecting on one passage, daily thinking about how it applies to our life, than it would be for us to read chapters every day and remember nothing from them. Meditate on it so that you may carefully observe everything written in it, for then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Haven't I commanded you? In case you forgot, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Why? For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. Isaiah 41 reads this. I brought you from the ends of the earth and called you from its farthest corners. I said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you. I haven't rejected you. Do not fear for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Be sure that all who are enraged against you will be ashamed and disgraced. Those who contend with you will become as nothing and will perish. You will look for those who contend with you, but you will not find them. Those who war against you will become absolutely nothing. Why? Because you're strong and mighty? For I am the Lord, your God. Who holds your right hand? Who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Isaiah 43 says this, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. We should remember the image of Moses crossing the Red Sea and the water splitting in front of him as he walks through it. The the mountains of water that are just the waves crashing but seem to be hitting some invisible barrier to prevent them from getting to God's people. And nothing in their entire existence would tell them they should be comfortable or courageous or bold in that morning are in that moment. But why are they? I will be with you, and the rivers will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, and the flames will not burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. I have given Egypt as a ransom for you, Cush and Seba in your place, because You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I will give people in exchange for you and nations instead of your life. Or Matthew 10. Don't fear those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him with right reverence and honor for who he is. Not belittling him as if he is not the author of the universe, but not trembling before him as if he has not set his sight on you and called you chosen and beloved. But fear him, who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Not with inflation. (laughs) Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs on your head have been counted. So don't be afraid. For you are worth more than many sparrows. Psalm 56. You yourself have recorded my wanderings. Do you ever feel like there's distance between you and God? And you just don't know 
You feel like you've wandered so far and you're like, I don't even know if he knows where I am. You feel the grief overwhelm you. You feel the clouds close in like there's darkness that surrounds you. You feel unseen and unknown. But the psalmist says, you have recorded my wanderings. And you have put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? He never loses track of his people. The Lord is my light, Psalm 27, and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? At the end of the chapter, it says this. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. In those seasons where you're struggling and you feel overwhelmed, wait for the Lord. When you don't know the answers and you feel like you are just surrounded by enemies, wait for the Lord. When the circumstances all but seem sure that you are going to fail and no one will think about it, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. You see, it wasn't your victory or my victory. It wasn't your accomplishments or mine that gained us these rights to be this courageous and hopeful no matter what we go through in this life. It was Jesus' victory that did it. And because he has accomplished his mission, we know the story. We know that three days after he went into that grave, he walked out of it. We know and we celebrate it yearly, but we should celebrate it a whole lot more that Jesus proved his message and his mission were a success when that dead body reanimated and came back to life. And we know that all the promises that he left you and me with, if we truly believe and love the Son, are ours and nothing can take them from us. Nothing in all of creation can take it from us. Father, what else could we ask for? What other hopes could we cling to other than this love? This love is sure and true and unshakable. This love is bought for us by you. Jesus, you, you paid it all so that we could have it all. I pray that you would turn our hearts to you, Jesus. Father, for anyone who is in here who does not trust you, who has not made that trust and commitment and wanted to follow you, Jesus, I pray that they would be so overwhelmed by the image of who you are that we see in your word, that, Father, you would just bring them to their knees to come to you. Father, to say, I want to be like Jesus, to love Jesus, to know the Father and the Spirit. I pray for people who are struggling with their faith, who have many doubts and questions, that, Father, this morning would just be an encouragement, that it would give them courage to keep pushing forward and believing in you no matter what they're going through. I pray, Father, for any of us who are believing lies that are compromising our ability to walk faithfully with you, Jesus, that you would rob us of them. Break us free. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Stand as we sing.